Hello, good evening everyone. I am Karin, Director of Practice and Innovation. Welcome to this discussion on breaking barriers to talking occupations. To quote Professor Gary Kilhoffner, humans have an innate drive to do. And as occupational therapists, we have the knowledge and expertise to understand how that drive is realized through our occupations. However, for many of us, we lose confidence in our unique perspective and offer as a profession, whether that's due to the demands in our working environment or general lack of public understanding. I hope OT Week this year launches a movement to no longer shrug and accept that no one understands what we do, but all 41 odd thousand registered occupational therapists, our student population and of course our support workforce makes a commitment to use the term occupation and to explain, educate and demonstrate our specialism so we can put that narrative to bed. So I'm delighted that we have Emma, an RCOT England board member chairing this panel discussion on how we can overcome the barriers to ensure occupation underpins our thinking, framing and practice. And thank you to our panel members, Mary, Katrina, Anuj, Rochelle and Jenny for stepping up to share their perspectives. If you've got any questions for the panel, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll endeavour to get to them. But Emma has some prepared questions now to get the ball rolling. Over to you, Emma. Thanks so much, Karin. OK, esteemed colleagues, this is going to be an interesting hour. Um, I'm going to start us off by asking the time old question that challenges us as occupational therapists. What are occupations? And I suppose I want to know, how do you describe it? And um, Mary, I think I'm going to come to you first, if that's all right. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, so for me, occupations are around our, it's our professional identity as occupational therapists. So if I was to describe what occupations are, I would say it's purposeful, it's meaningful activities or tasks that anyone would do in their day to day lives. Um, that, that, that means something to an individual. But that in itself is challenging. I think for us as OTs and also for clients to really understand that because that's such a broad and, and vast definition. Um, so I would I would caveat that definition with examples of what that can mean. And, it, and I think I would personally tailor it to the audience that I'm speaking to, depending on who I'm speaking to and what's real, what's relevant to them. So for example, I might talk about um, physical activities such as getting dressed to actually roles such as getting on, on, on the bus or working a, as an employee, going to, going to a job and how meaningful that is for them. But for me also, I would, I would highlight the benefits of how intrinsic occupation is to wellbeing and health and the importance, and as occupational therapists, what we believe is the importance of occupations to improve an individual's wellbeing and health. Lovely, Mary. And I, I think you've really hit home for me, you know, that sense that it's everything and that somehow weirdly makes it complicated, but it's also really simplistic. It's, it's a weird thing we get stuck in. Katrina, any thoughts from an academic perspective or from your perspective? I don't know, academic perspective feels a bit hard for this time of night. So um, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think probably some of the um, challenges about probably why we find it quite hard to talk about it is because particularly with things like doing, being and becoming, which were developed from talking about occupations, was done quite theoretically to start off with. So, so I think what Mary did really nicely there was to bring it alive with examples and stuff. And I think that's where it makes the theory much, much easier to talk about it. But I, I try and break it down into thinking about everyday activities. But then again, a bit like what Mary did just as well, is like how these things combine to create our roles and routines because that's the complexity, isn't it? It's, you know, just thinking about an activity like making a cup of tea does seem like very simplistic and nothing, but it's making a cup of tea in our contextual history of what that means. And for some people, it doesn't have any meaning. For other people, it has lots of meaning. But, you know, or if you're, you know, doing it as a grandmother, it might be very different than if you're making the first cup of tea you've ever made for your mum and stuff. So um, it, that's where the difference is added in, I think, in terms of um, why it's much more complex than it seems on the surface. So. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else on the panel want to chip in? How do you describe what are occupations? 
I'm happy to to come yeah, in here. Thanks, I really love, you know, what was said about, you know, making it individualistic and meaningful. I think definitely throughout not just my practice, but just in general, um, you know, I've realized how important it is to have meaningful but activities that are catered to you, catered to your culture, your background, your likes, you know, your interests. Um, and it's really important because, you know, and I, I guess something else was said about it doesn't matter how small or big your, you know, the occupations are. Um, it's even the little things like, like you said, making a cup of tea, going out for a walk. It doesn't have to be anything fancy um, because it's it's part of all aspects of our daily lives. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely very, very complex. It sounds, you know, simple, you know, to the ear, but um, yes, I do agree in terms of ensuring that it's meaningful and, um, and also, Occupation can change as well. It's also about learning new things. Occupations don't always stay the same. It evolves as you evolve as an individual, and, you know, even the service users that we work with. So it's, it's always good to bear in mind that it's um, it's ever, ever changing. Totally, Jenny. And I think that's what I really love about the campaign this year is, you know, that simple message, occupations are the building blocks of life and they're everything we want and need to do. It, it really helps us with the language, doesn't it, around that complexity? Yeah. So I obviously also, tonight. Oh, yeah, go ahead. As I say, well, I just also think that we do have to be really careful, though, that we, we don't sound too Pollyannish about it, because obviously it's yeah. not always, it, sometimes it's a negative effect of occupations. So that's also why you need an occupational therapist as well. So sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted you there. Sorry. <laughs> No, absolutely. I think that's a, a really important point, and I'm I'm very glad you did. Yeah, I, I, it's that complexity is the issue, isn't it? Really overcoming that, and and all the positives and negatives, and the risks and the um, everything else that comes with everybody's occupations. Yeah. So obviously tonight we're going to think particularly about barriers as well. So I'm wondering, you know, what do you think the barriers are um, to talking about occupations? Why is it so hard? And I guess for people listening tonight and online later, um, how we go, how can we overcome these barriers? So yeah, I'm wondering, Rochelle, from a student perspective, what your sorts of thoughts are on that? Yeah. I think it's interesting as students we are when we go out onto placement we are told to talk about occupations to clients it's part of what we get assessed on um, but I often found that I would just mimic what my practice educator said and never really kind of made those meanings for myself and we do do um, an interprofessional working module where we um, do a, a mock MDT with different students from different professions and that was when I really saw the unique perspective that we have when we're looking at occupations. And that kind of allowed me more to develop my own professional identity and the way I wanted to explain things. And that kind of helped to shape my understanding and what I felt like I wanted to say as a, as a student. Can I ask you what you do say, or is that putting you on the spot too much? Because <laughs> I think it's really important for yeah. you know all of the people earlier on in their careers to, to have that language. Well, I think this is what I'm trying to do is not to have okay. something I say. I'm trying to do the opposite where I take it from the person who I'm speaking to and then try and tailor it from there. So I get asked a lot by you know friends and things, you know, what is it you actually what is it you actually doing? But it it the answer always changes and the more times I change it and don't stick to the same script the more I feel comfortable okay I can explain this to anybody because I change it up every time and I make it um, like what was said before unique to the person that I'm speaking to. Lovely so almost like you're kind of you know it's growing and evolving in you as part of your yeah. occupational identity a bit as well there yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah. Fantastic. But what I suppose I'm also hearing is is stuff around confidence, maybe as well, and growing confidence mm -hmm. to use the language, talk about the barriers. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, is anybody else want to come in around the barriers and, and how you've experienced barriers to talking about occupations in the past? Um, I can come in after I've meeting. Yeah. Um, but uh, Michelle, one thing that resonated from what you said is the importance of role modeling. So you're listening to what more esteemed people are saying in the profession and how they're describing it. So one of my take homes from what you just said is the importance of what we're all saying as a collective and role modeling that message and that constant language um, of what, what is uh, occupation. 
And I think, Emma, you, for me, you've hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of it is around confidence and how do we build up our confidence? And you say, this is such a unique skill. It's so important. It's so valuable. And we can help improve lives. We can help be cost effective. There's so much things that we can do by looking at occupations. So for me, I think one of the barriers is to try and overcome that confidence. Do that, I would say. It's around uh, a community of practice, even doing what we're doing today, just having other peers come together and discussing it. I think that really, really helps. Um, and I think for me also, it's about evidence-based what we do. I think we've said before that occupation is simple, but we've got the invisible clinical reading that we're doing as occupational therapists. If we can like, shine that and show that even a simple task, we're breaking that down and we're, we're, doing, we, we're gaining so much information from doing that. So I think um, being quite, uh, making our invisible clinical reasoning really visible and also being evidence-based, I think for, um, um, in, especially in the healthcare setting um, and, and more so in social care, it's about being really proving our work and being evidence-based. I know for me, there's a bit of a plug. Um, I've joined the um, RTOT Research Connect. I found that really helpful to know what's out there, what people are saying, and just having that network, so it goes back to the community of practice network, I think will give us that confidence to raise that profile of what occupation is for occupational therapists. Absolutely. And I suppose also there amongst the, the stuff around confidence, we're also starting to hit on some of those sort of systemic barriers a little bit as well that, that hit us in the face, isn't it? I'm wondering if anyone wants to come in around about those wider barriers, you know, not not the internal ones, the other ones. Anuj, you look like you're yeah. going to come in. Of course. Um, yeah. If you look at specifically at systemic barriers, uh, I think we believe in occupational engagement as our unique selling point you know that that's how we grow through university and our experience somehow changes when we come into the working world wherein our rules are very finely defined what we do is very finely defined by our rules you know what you know so uh, what I do in a hospital setting what I do in an acute hospital setting or what I do in a community setting and people understand what we do in, in a very narrow aspect, you know, so although we are occupational therapists, for example, you, you, you know, so every assessment and intervention we undertake will have elements of self-care, productivity and leisure, we gather information, we look at how much we support people and depending on how much time we can spend and what the system expects of us, we can sometimes exclusively focus on self-care. But then that might be how people understand us, you know, so the person who assesses whether you can carry out your self-care activities in order to be discharged home or the person who carries out specialist assessment for equipment and adaptations in a community setting to ensure you can continue to maintain uh, health and quality of life at home. And if people only understand us that way in the system, then actually growing beyond, you know, it is about everything that gives people meaning and purpose in life and the importance of that uh, and the lasting impact that can have if we can look at the person as a whole and what matters to them as a whole rather than what is the matter with them. Yeah. And how but do we overcome that? Yeah. 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 So for me, in some senses, overcoming it's, it's almost like a control breaking of the system. And again, this, this sounds like a complicated concept, but in a sense, if we... I always you know, say, if you keep doing, you know, so there's a very popular saying that, you know, if you keep doing the same thing the same way, you're always going to get the same results. Now we're working in systems wherein we are working the same way. The demand is always overreaching supply and that demand's only increasing with complex comorbidity. Um, so the only way we can actually improve the situation is by starting to affect that demand. And that's where the true power in occupation lies. You know, so we need to start thinking of, well, how can we start having preventative, proactive conversations? How can we look at the assets that a person possesses and the power to create autonomy, to create change in their own circumstance, you know, own their own circumstance and therefore create positive effect in their own life? Um, and then the system supports you. So we need to kind of almost change the way we work, but in a controlled manner starts with small improvement ideas where we're helping people identify well-being goals and track the impact of those well-being goals instead of going in and carrying out deficit-based assessments and intervention and sticking a plaster tape, treating the symptom, not the cause. You know, in, in effect, the cause, there's a lot of um, increase in physical inactivity, incidentary behavior levels, but we treat the impact of that 
which is, you know, a need for equipment adaptation because I have less physical ability and mental ability. We're treating that through endpoint treating of the symptoms, but we're not treating the cause, which is actually the lack of occupation in the person's life. So in a sense, we just need to start small, but we need, we need a gentle break into the system where we need to start focusing on the person. What is, you know, so I kind of go back to that simple statement of a focus on what matters to me, not what is the matter with me. Absolutely. And it feels like, and has done for the last little while, actually, that it is politically, NHS wise, what our patients want, you know, there's a real drive in that direction. And yet we still hear as a profession that these barriers are there and we're struggling to overcome them. Um, I'm wondering, Katrina, is there anything you want to come in on about barriers and, and how we overcome them? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, earlier in my career, I did used to have quite a lot of stock phrases. I think it's really interesting that Rochelle says she doesn't want those stock phrases. And it's funny because in I did the video that I did in preparation for this, somebody wrote in and asked what stock phrases are, but they were just sets of phrases that I had, I had in a kind of stockpile in my head that I could use, which I know I, was, I can't actually even remember what some of them were now, but I think probably what I've shifted more to, and maybe this also reflects how what your strategies you might need at one point changes as you get more confident, but then you need new confidences, I think is really being able to think about the impact of what we do. So instead of just saying it's important, it's linking into the things that Mary said about the evidence base, but actually saying, so recently I was in a context where we were talking about public health and somebody point blank said, yeah, but we don't need an occupational therapist to do that. And I said, yeah, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. So I think that's the other thing is don't get defensive. Don't get yep. cross because, you know, that really doesn't help the argument. So just like, oh, I hear what you're saying. I said, except that we know we all need to take, do more exercise. We know we all need to eat better, but nobody's doing it because actually what you need is somebody that can look at somebody's life with them and their life and then look at the life, their own lifestyle challenges and then start to look at those types of things. And that's what an occupational therapist does. It looks at your everyday activities, how they combine to create the routines that you live by and the roles that you're doing. And, and the interconnections between them. And then through that, you can actually start to have more challenging conversations. And if we can do that, then maybe people really will start to take more exercise. Maybe they really yep. will. But you actually start showing them what the difference is. So the questions on how you do things differently and what the impact of that will be. And I think that is really powerful. And again, it just comes back to the things that have been said earlier, why it's important, but also what, what the evidence is to show that it makes a difference. So, so I, I think that's really helpful. And lifestyle redesign is a really great example from the University of Southern California to help people visualize it as well. Because I think sometimes people find it hard to visualize what we're saying. So people Absolutely. know what a role is, but they don't really understand how the activities fit together to make a role. So, Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's all of those different bits. But I think once you start to unpack that for people with these very real practical examples, and then people can start to get interested and then you don't even have to drive the conversation more because they're usually asking you more questions than you can keep up answering really. So Totally. And you're really making me think there as well about the, the it isn't just about the occupations, it's about the word meaning and meaningful, mm -hmm. isn't it? And we mm -hmm. keep coming back yeah. to that as a panel because, mm -hmm. you know, one of the barriers I think about is, is sometimes this stuff can feel like everybody's business, you know, and we can get defensive. You used that word, Katrina, didn't mm -hmm. you, about, you know, we can feel this is our, this is our territory, you know, we, we deal with occupations. And, you know, when we look at other professional groups that also touch on all of that and, and try and yeah. encourage people with lifestyle change, what is it that makes us different? And that's a barrier too, I think. Our defensiveness can be a barrier, but I think also our protectiveness of occupations can be a barrier. Well, I mean, I think in some ways, it's not surprising that we do that because I mean, I recently, or in the last few years, had to help somebody uh, with a fellowship application and I spent time coaching them in talking about occupation. And one of the other, Matt Penham panel members said to me, that was a complete waste of time that could have been used talking about research methodology. And I suggest that you're a physiotherapist. When have you ever walked into a panel and somebody questioned the link between exercise and health or yeah. diet and health? I said, and then on top of that, people will question occupational health. But if you make a good case for it, they'll say, yeah, but the psychologist will do that or somebody else can do it. Everybody thinks they've got the corner on lifestyle issues and yeah. on routines and habits. And so we have to spell it out. And it is really hard. I mean, I have sat in meetings with, you know, particularly, you know, a lot of male professors you know, saying, well, just make this a band for, this isn't, 
you know, skilled activity. And it, you, you could get, you know, very upset apart from anything else. And you have to learn to like, you know, I've learned to like calm down, breathe, maybe not to respond immediately to give myself that, but never ever leave the room without it being corrected. I think that's the other thing that I've made a deal with myself now. I might not answer it in the moment because I maybe haven't got the equanimity and the calmness to do it without sounding defensive, but I will not leave the room. So I, even if it's getting to the end, I'll say, can I just have a point of, you know, uh, and any other business or can I just clarify something from earlier and make sure that I do get the point across in a really cool, calm manner. But it's taken me a while to learn that. And also, yeah, I think you have to be shocked a few times that how sometimes people can be quite dismissive of what is actually something that's very skilled. But we've got to help people to understand how skilled it is. But I think that was also the joy of what Michael Rosen did at the conference, wasn't it? Is he was talking about how people saved his life, but that wasn't his life. And what he needed to get his life back was the therapeutic intervention. And we've got to, you know, about these everyday activities that he did, going to the Jewish deli, going for a walk with his grandchildren. You know, that's what we've got to bring alive to people. Because those things, don't, they sound trivial and unimportant until you can't do them anymore. And then your life isn't worth living. And, Absolutely. you know, it's a painting, those evocative pictures, isn't it? Sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> not at all not at all and I suppose it's making me wonder about coming to you Jenny a bit from you know in a in a clinical perspective how important that stuff is both in in expressing all of those things Katrina said in an MDT where maybe we get misunderstood or the occupations could be taken off down a different professional path and and is that something you kind of feel you have to continually come back to clinically yes 100 percent. and as I was listening I was being reminded of you know when I sort of first qualified I was you know newbie OT and I found it really difficult in ward rounds to kind of you know express and explain what I was doing with the the patients and uh, my my uh, my manager said something that was that really stuck with me and stuck with me throughout and she said to continue using the terminology that we, we know within occupational therapy and if they ask the question in terms of what are you talking about? What does this mean? Explain it to them. Because she asked me, have you ever been in meetings where you don't have a clue of what's being said, all the jargon, the language and all that kind of stuff? And I have. And it's the same thing. And, and I asked the question and they explained it back to me. And I think we should be doing the same. Um, and as I started doing that, I found that the team, MDT team that I was with, started using the language even around me. And you know, I was getting less and less questions on the reports in terms of oh, what does this mean, what does that mean? So I think it's collectively, and I'm sure a lot of people are doing now, but it's actually doing what we do best and explaining that in our meetings. And if there are any questions, be open to answer them. Yes, sometimes we, not sometimes, most of the time, we get asked the same questions over and over again. Um, but that's, that's just something that we're going to have to do until it becomes a, a pattern. Um, but and also when I'm talking to, you know, when we're talking about like um, barriers in terms of, you know, with our service users, um, especially, you know, when I'm looking from a cultural aspect, um, you know, looking at occupations, it means different, different things in different occupations and in different cultures, sorry. Um, so I've had to sort of educate myself and go back and do my own learning. You know, what does occupation mean in, in this type of culture and how can I connect and support my service user by doing that? So I think that there is a responsibility, not just as OTs, but as health professionals to go over and beyond, depending yeah. on, and, and actually learning and doing the extra work depending on the client group, because there are so many barriers that I've sort of seen. And, you know, as I continue to grow, as an O2, I look back in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I, I perhaps could have handled things a lot better um, if I'd noticed this aspect or, you know, you, you know, different things, language, you know, yep. in, in terms of that. So, um, yeah, I, I do still continue to do that. And even now, um, because I've been doing it so much, it's a habit. So right now, um, so I've got a dual role. So in the role where I'm not an occupational therapist I still find myself using the terminology because it's just so ingrained now um so yeah I think it's just about like, like I said having that confidence um and that comes with time as well you know you've got to give yourself some grace to to grow in that confidence to explain yourself because it can be quite daunting you know when you're being questioned all the time um but then again like I said you know educating yourself in other areas uh, because occupation and meaningful occupation is so complex um, from what you know I've sort of learned and, and seen over the years. 
I love that, Jenny. Uh, what I really pick out there from you is, you know, an ability to not assume that people are coming at it because we need to be defensive and they don't want to understand, but actually that we have a role to educate people in occupations, in occupational therapy, in the way that we use occupations to support people. But I think also that constant reminder to check on ourselves that we really do understand the meaning behind people's occupations. And does that mean the same to me as it means to you? And, and what's the background that's led to all of our understanding? And it's such important things for us to remember and also you know not not just remember but this is part of the growth of occupational therapy you know it's really important that we keep pushing our profession forward in that direction um holding meaning important you know right in the center panel i want us to have a think about um you know we're assuming here that occupations are essential that's what our whole profession is based on um that occupations are essential to people and health and well-being but why is it simply not a nice to have? And we've touched on that a little bit, but you know, if, if, it, if we get right into it, why is it, you know, not just a nice to have? Why is it absolutely essential? And I, I think I'm, I'm gonna come back to you, Anna, because you've been a little bit quiet. So let's, let's see, what do you think on that one? Okay, so in, in, in my opinion, occupation is essential. Two or three points, I would say. Um, Occupation-centered practice ha has a massive role to play um, in terms of helping health and well-being there's few things here so when we undertake a focus on occupation you know what is purposeful what is meaningful what i truly care about in life and how can i add more experiences in life that any new activity goals i'm able to establish any new um it, you know activities or re-engaging in activities that were meaningful to me that you're able to, as an occupational therapist to help me establish naturally bring in an additional uh, increase in my physical activity levels. They bring in a reduction in my sedentary behavior level. And there is a huge stream of data and research that backs that every single time we're enhancing our activity levels, we uh, have a host of benefits that come from it, you know, including, you know, um, we can have a reduction in, uh, you know, some, some indicating the reduction in uh, possibly a dementia, reduction in type 2 diabetes, reduction in various forms of cancer. You know, so it's not just a small thing. It actually carries a lot of power by simply adding a bit more movement in life. But that comes, for me, occupation make it sustainable. You know, we, we've just touched earlier on when Katrina was talking about, you know, let's do more exercise. But we all know we should do more exercise, but nobody do, does more exercise because it's not sustainable. And I talk, you know, that kind of brings me to my second part of, you know, when we focus on occupation, what is truly meaningful to me, we have an intrinsic reward within the activity itself. So it brings movement, but it, the movement benefits come from the intrinsic reward we get from the activity. So we're not doing it like exercise, something that's unpleasant for an abstract benefit in the future. We are doing something that truly gives us meaning in life, something we enjoy doing and movement just seems to happen because of it. You know, so we get those additional benefits. And, and I always yep. say, I talk about health by stealth. The best movement is a movement that you don't know you're doing. You're just doing more of something that really gives meaning to your life and movement just happens to come with it. And the third aspect, we have, a, again, because going back to the data and the research and the information we've got, we've got a lot of data to tell us that when we do something that is truly meaningful to us or something that we really enjoy, it helps us attain a state of flow. Uh, and, and there's ample evidence to indicate that the more we attain a, state of, attain a state of flow, it helps us unlock our true physical and mental potential, which allows us to actually tell, show, show so much to ourselves as to other people what we are actually physically capable of and that helps break through our own stereotypes and other stereotypes and that sustained performance state of flow can lead to a permanent lasting impact in health and quality of life as against like i've said before deficit-based assessment and intervention that has a transient impact at best Absolutely. so that would be my kind of key things for why a focus on occupation is so much more essential uh, as yeah. compared to our deficit-based interventions do you know, I'm going to coin your phrase. I think you should copyright that health by stealth. I don't know if you stole it from someone or if you made it up, but that is that is a gem, that one. Um, <laughs> I suppose also what I'm really hearing there is added value, isn't it? And that's a coin, you know, that term uh, RCOT have used quite a bit, I think. But, you know, 
what we're hearing is occupations are essential. They're not simply a nice to have. They bring you so, mother, so many other benefits. And Katrina, I could see you nodding along there. Oh, lots of you actually nodding along there. Um, do you want to come in on that one? I think at the end of the day, we're probably the only profession that has the absolute complete stamp from the World Health Organization. So, you know, I'll read the, um, the definition of health from the World Health Organization. It's a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that complete sense of physical, mental and um, social well-being is what we work on. So yep. we actually get people back to that sense of their life and being able to engage in the things that are important to them. And that is when people truly experience health. It isn't necessarily just because they've had a thing fixed or they've now had some medication. And I think we should really own that, that we bring about participation and participate without participation, there is no health. You know, that and you know, and if anybody says, well, who says that? The World Health Organization says that, you know, what more endorsement? Argue with them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know like you know in our countries are signatory to that and you know, most of the countries in the world are signatory to that so you know we have the absolute stamp for approval we should actually um, I mean I can see some of the comments that are coming through saying people sh you know we shouldn't be saying um, negative but I don't think I am I think I'm really positive about occupations but unfortunately that's not what we face all the time in our working lives and that's what I've been talking about today but I don't feel the need to be defensive because I actually feel that we actually have all of these things in our armament, the things that we can say. And I know that some people say, well, what language do you use? I talk about occupation and balance. I talk about um, um, engagement. I talk about participation. These are the Latin words and language that I use. And I link them constantly back. And so this is what I do. And this is the focus of the work that I do every day as an occupational therapist. So, and I, I think that does make a difference. So, and I think if we're positive, it does help respond to that things but it doesn't stop the fact that there are lots of people out there think that what we do is easy and that they could all do it I mean it's very insulting in a lot of ways given that we all do a decree but you know so but we have to kind of make those connections people so that they start to see the complexity that we innately know absolutely Anuj I can see you want to come back in too yeah I mean the, you know I, there's there's also looking at you know even from the perspective of what the people who are our client population themselves want. So, you know, so most of my work is around working with the elderly population. So like the, you know, recent research looked at what, are the, what do older people themselves feel um, are things that would help them enhance their physical activity levels and hence the benefits that go with it. And the key factors identified by the older adults in that study, you know, collection of studies was very clear that the activities we engage in must feel safe must provide a sense of social connectedness, be enjoyable, and be accessible in terms of cost and ability. Now, to me, that screams occupation-centered practice. You know, so yeah. even our client populations themselves identify that for us to have a positive change in life, we need to engage in things that give us more connections, more fun, um, more access, something that's easy to do and feel safe to do. You know, which so it's all about finding those um, important experiences in life that we can repeat on a regular basis and have those enhanced benefits of activity levels. Really lovely. I'm going to turn us to thinking more around our USP, I suppose, a bit more. I, and I've used this term quite a bit throughout my career of the fact that occupations are our superpower. You know, that's our powerhouse. That's what we live and breathe. How do we as a profession own our unique superpower not to say we need to run around with our capes on or anything but how do we own that superpower and if it's all right Rochelle I'm going to bring you in um again I think it is um a bit about you know when you are explaining what it is and how that can be transformative for people um and particularly what we look at and I was thinking when we were talking there about how roles are so important to people and their identity and their self-esteem and that's if you can't do certain occupations you can't fulfill your roles and that can be so important to people and I think somebody being able to be the person they see themselves as is that's a superpower that's something that yeah. you can't you know, if you give somebody that confidence and that self-esteem and you say like, you know, what's important to you? What's meaningful? What do you want to be able to do? Um, this is where we can come in. And yeah, not all the time your life is going to look like what it looked like before. But if there's a way that you can still have that sense of who you are and that can 
transform and occupations can transform that for you um I think that's that's definitely a superpower oh my god are you that I'm so glad we're recording this because I think people need to watch that bit back really brilliant because it you know superpowers aren't just ours are they what you're saying there is that become the whole the occupation and the occupational therapy is the superpower and you're giving that you know you're saying what do you want how do we work together what's important to you and that's the power it, it, yeah absolutely I mean we're all sold aren't we because we're all in the room um but you know that's the message we've got to get out there yeah anyone else want to come in on the superpower i think it's also um our ability to work in so many various settings and add so much value um again i can so only speak on my experience but working in criminal justice i initially never thought an ot could could work in there but when I did and I learned a bit more I, I saw the value that we could add um, in, in these type of settings so you know I, I think our main superpower power is being able to link all those things together and look at things from a holistic perspective yeah um, and you know utilize our skills in very creative ways as well um, and sometimes it might be in ways that people when I say people but even other clinical staff might not be able to fully understand but that just shows how complex and just how much work goes into you know our thought process um our assessments um and things like that so yes being able to work in all these different settings and supporting various people in in different ways um i, I think is definitely our, our our superpower or you know slash skill set unique skill set that we have lovely Mary, you're going to come in? Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I'm just going to add that I think we, we are preaching to the converted here, looking at all the comments in the talk. We all know that occupations are superpower. And actually, it's actually empowering our clients to utilise their superpowers too. Yeah. I think the challenge comes with um, um, sharing that outside of our profession. So I think um, to really shine our superpowers, I think we, we, we need to take time to really evidence our outcomes evidence that, that, that uh, demonstrate the impact that, it, that our superpowers are having and people can then people will ride the bus I think um, just for from my perspective in social care we have social prescribers we have all these other roles and I'm just thinking that's an OT that's, a, that's our core philosophy is OT so people are seeing it we, we're doing it already and it's just shining that and sharing our good practice um, externally outside our profession absolutely Anuj Come in. Just, just to slightly add along the same lines, you know, um, for us to use our superpower, and you know, so we're having a conversation about, oh, you know, but that person, that new role sounds just like what we always do, but are we always doing it? You know, so to me, that's the key here. We need to start ensuring that we're having asset-based conversations with every single interaction with our client group. You know, so when we do carry, it doesn't matter you're in an acute setting. We can still have a conversation. We can still leave someone with information or, or develop information leaflets and things like that. And there's ample support out there in various uh, you know, spheres that can help you do that. But having those asset-based conversations about, I'm here to carry out an assessment for a particular aspect, but what's important to you? What matters to you? How are you expanding your world? And how, you know, how much benefit you could have if you were able to engage in more occupations and re learn to re-engage in the occupations that you haven't been engaging in before, you know, w you still carry out the self-care assessment. You can still spend just five extra minutes in helping someone develop those activity goals. But if we don't have those asset-based conversations ourselves, then we can't say that, you know, that is occupational therapy that that other person is doing because we're not owning it ourselves. You know, so start with every single time you just spend five more minutes, develop a mechanism of having that asset-based conversation with helping people establishing some activity goals is, is a way, you know, we step towards us starting to own our superpower. Lovely. Katrina. I, I would just like to add a little comment to what Mary said about social prescribing. And I think social prescribing captures some of what occupational therapists does, but I don't think it's as nuanced. And I've definitely worked with mental health patients who have said that when they've gone to a social prescribing service, there's like a range of options. If you don't fit into the options, they don't really know what to do with you. And I think that's our superpower is that 
We've, yeah. we've got a range of options, but we've also got lots of different problem solving solutions that are tailored to the individual. Because it again comes back to that thing about you know the health by stealth. It's got to fit in with somebody's life. It's got to make sense to them, and, and it's got to have meaning and motiv- you know to, to motivate people. So, so, so I do think social prescribing is good per se, but it's not purely occupational therapy, and I don't think it quite captures our superpower in the way that we have it and, and how it's experienced by people. I don't think so. Absolutely. And I suppose what we're really talking about there around all the superpower stuff is being confident in our superpower, explaining it, going back to our roots, being clear how essential occupations are and what they are. And I really hope today's panel has given um, the audience and everyone listening and catching up online an opportunity to really think that through for themselves as well. How do they apply that in their role? What's their meaning? What's their superpower? And what do they bring to all those relationships, um, both with clients and colleagues and people we work with? Karin, I'm going to hand back to you because I think it might be time for us to have some questions from the audience. Thank you. And I just want to say to the panel, if you haven't had a chance to look at the chat, there's a lot of support um, and a lot of further debate in the chat uh, based around your your comments and sharing your experience. So thank you. It's it's been really active. Uh, The most popular question we've got in here is the first one, actually. If occupation is the participation in activities that we need and want to do, do you think that the term is outdated and confuses the public when it has so many other common meanings already? Do you want me to start? Would that be helpful? Fantastic. If you would, that would be great, yeah. Katrina. Um, I mean, language is language, and obviously we do need to be careful about the language that we use, but I think we have to stop going back to, is this what we should do? At the end of the day, we're focusing on doing and people's everyday um, activities and to be occupied in an activity is an occupation. So, so the language is appropriate from that. And obviously the term participation is, that is you know, fundamental to the World Health Organization definition of health. So I don't know how more current and contemporary you can get than that really so I feel happy with the use of that language I feel that it it is useful I mean I'm obviously very conscious that in this week we've chosen how we frame that language and maybe we do need to go back and look at that but actually it's the fundamentals of how it transforms people that's really important and we if we start putting too much energy into how we define ourselves we're going to lose the momentum that we've really gained around the differences that we're making in people's lives and that would be a real shame because this feels exciting. I, absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Katrina. And I'm just going to bring Emma in because the, the joy of me coming in now to, is that we can ask Emma to uh, put in her thoughts and perspective. Emma. Thanks, Karin. Um, yeah, I, I suppose that's something I've pondered quite a lot, actually, is, is you know, is the problem just the word? Is, is that the problem why people don't understand? Is that why we get tripped over? And actually, I do agree with Katrina that we've come so far and I feel certainly all the OTs I work um, with feel really clear actually I think they feel clearer than they've ever felt as a community about what occupations mean in the context of occupational therapy Um, so I'd be really um, worried I suppose about starting to change things and I suppose I also have debated in my own mind and with colleagues change it to what you know that that's the other thing because all the other words like activity and doing and participate they all have lots of other meanings and things as well Um, so yeah I my vote would also be we are where we are let's own our superpower let's own own this space and I'd be really confident in it as well but it it is it is tricky um, from that perspective And, and the English language does not help does it in terms of the multiple meanings for the same thing so it's it's really it is, it's a hard one. I, I understand fully why people might feel another way. And a person to... in the comments just put something about participation and activity, but participation has a particular meaning that's more about like occupational engagement rather than just participating in activity. So once you start down this line, we're already getting very semantic and getting away from the difference we make for people, which is the most important thing. So... Uh, absolutely. And I, I think, uh, you know, we at, at RCOT, we held a, a series of round uh, road shows many years ago, and we just said, stop saying OT, say occupational therapy. And we saw people skipping out of the session 
because of that sense of yes we've got to own our title um and and just that simple flip of of saying occupational therapy and not not just ot um i i just want to quote dr katrina danza who who used to work at rcot and she always referenced google google used to be the name of a company it's now become a verb we don't search engine something we tend to google we can do that we've got the power as an as a as a profession to educate people so that occupation just becomes something that everybody understands um so i i, I always draw on that excite uh, that that example um lovely thank you i'm going to move on to a, a, another question and and um i think uh, Katrina, you sort of touched on this, but um, so I might go to you first, but then move on to somebody else in the panel. Um, somebody posted, I've just wondered if anyone from the panel has experience with the dark side of occupation, how to manage not agreeing with a client's occupation, but it being something that is meaningful to them. Yeah. I mean, obviously that that is a real challenge particularly um, it's probably actually better for somebody like Jenny to speak to this one actually because in terms of criminogenic behaviours I don't think anybody's faced with it more often I'll, I'll hand over to you Jenny I think yes so, thanks yeah, yeah. yeah definitely it's um it's it's very difficult because you know working in you know mental health uh, forensic mental health and prison um as well it's you know you've, you've you work with clients who have occupations who but those occupations are you know quite on the negative side and um harmful not just to themselves but to other people and I think with that I, I always I always try and look at um you know I try to sort of unpack occupation obviously there's other you know factors that contribute to it you know mental health and societal and upbringing and things like that but you know, from an OT's point of view, it's it's more so looking at you know what are what are the types of occupation this person is engaging with, and how can we trans transfer those skills into more positive and meaningful occupations. Um, it doesn't always you know translate exactly like that, but it's at least a starting point. Um, so when looking at you know dark occupations. Um, and you know working with you know service users who engage in activities who which i guess are meaningful to them in in a sense but obviously aren't beneficial to other people it's more so around understanding the basis of it so looking at the skill set is there anything that we can support with in terms of utilizing those skills so i always um you know think back you know when i was working with um someone a while ago who um, loved, you know, planes and things, airplanes and things like that. However, the crime that he committed was very um, technical. Like he's really into tech, and I use that as a starting point. Tech, you're really into, you know, computers and things like that. So how can we translate that into something more positive? Getting involved in um, in education, computer class. So I think that's why, I, you know, like I said earlier on, in terms of what are maybe not superpower, but what are expertise is it's it's about dissecting occupations as, as a general but also dissecting what people are good at their skill sets and transferring them so yeah we, we definitely it, it can be quite difficult it can affect I suppose even for me like morally you know I'm, I'm trying to support somebody who's done or he, who's engaging in more darker sides of occupation but um yeah like, like I said we we have that skill set and that expertise to be able to trans help um you know trans transfer those type of skills into you know something a bit more more meaningful um and also educational wise and being able to work as part of a team I think that's another thing it's whilst we we are experts in our field um, just like any other profession, we're not alone. We are supposed to work alongside each other. So I think that's also important to know that it doesn't, the responsibility doesn't just fall on, on us because we're an expert in that field. It's about sharing our expertise with other people. Thank you, Jenny. And, and actually somebody, Sarah, just posted in the chat that darker occupations are serving a need, helping the person find a way to meet that need in a health promoting way is the key to to the role of occupational therapy so absolutely and, and navigating that is is the challenge um emma you want to come in 
Yeah, I suppose just really simply, I suppose to say, I was thinking as you were talking, Jenny, about how I've tried to navigate that clinically before. And ultimately what we're talking about there is really, really using activity analysis, isn't it? So really breaking down what is all the different components of that occupation and the meaning behind it and where, what skills does it need? What, you know, tasks are involved and really breaking that down and then separating it out again to see where you can use those components again. And that's activity analysis, isn't it? in its purest form, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a, a, another question. Um, I work in adult community mental health and we often discuss occupations as being things you want, need and have to do. It's really difficult when people lack motivation due to poor mental health to get them on board with the have to do activities is not necessarily something that is meaningful to them. So the, the sorry, I didn't read that correctly. The, 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 the to do, the have to do activities is not necessarily meaningful for them for example, housework. Is this something others come across and how do you over overcome this? Anybody got any top tips? Emma, I'm going to go to you whilst the others have a think because you're on the main screen. <laughs> Oh, that's a worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know Anish, Anish did have his hand up as well, so I'll give you the... Oh, sorry, the Anish. Up. No, sorry. don't worry. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to... I suppose in my clinical career, I wouldn't start with the have-tos. That would be where I would begin. I am naturally someone who starts at the point of least resistance and works as much as you can with the want to do. Um, because I think sometimes they're all tied in and also you motivation is such a complex thing as well isn't it that you you've got to build the tiny building blocks is how I think about motivation it's not one thing it's, it's little components so my top tip I guess would be don't start with the have to start with the want to's start small start with something really really simple straightforward comp as simple as you can make it and always make it achievable I think the motivation stuff has to be built baby 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 steps at a time that would be my top tip. Thanks, Emma. And um, I was listening to a bit of a debate the other day around should we be person centred or person led? Should we be changing that 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 focus? And um, that speaks to your point about starting with what is important to the person um, gaining that motivation. And my apologies, didn't see your hand, but please come in. <laughs> It's okay, actually, in many senses, Emma said exactly what I was going to say. I think if, for me, it's it's looking at it as a journey, not as a intervention that you fix, you know, so you would start with, you, know, you start with what creates a good day for you, what is important to you, what would you enjoy doing? So I think the first step has to be about getting me to engage in more occupations than I am engaging in at the moment. Once the person is more engaging more in occupations they see the value and the inherent benefit that that brings and then you can have the journey towards the have to but you have to start with the want to why should i care why you know when they have the person it's the human side of change isn't it you have to see the difference it makes you have to understand why it's important so there's the first aspect of how much are we explaining what the harm comes to us from not engaging much not not having a lot in life not not having many things that give us meaning and purpose and what benefits come from having that and then what kind of thing would make a difference what would you enjoy doing so you're starting there and once you build your ability once you build your confidence and once you build the rapport and help the person see the difference that is making in their life then there might be a journey towards the have to or sometimes that's when you have to compensate you know so you're in not every person in every situation you'd be able to get to all the have to's but if you leave the person with a lot more occupation in their life than they used to have then the likely physical and mental health benefit would still be significant absolutely and i i think absolutely it's all about that trust isn't it it's building mm -hmm. that relationship and 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 taking that person then on 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 that journey with you um, I just now have um, two questions which mention physiotherapy. So the first one is currently on placement and getting frustrated that I cannot express my role and always just have to describe it similar to physiotherapy. How do I overcome this? And while you're just thinking about that, I will go to the other question that, that, that mentions physiotherapy. How do we separate ourselves from physio? 
always find us under shadowed by physios and find it difficult for us to have our own stamp. So who would like to come in on this one? Well, I was going to I was going to pull Rochelle in, but if you start, Katrina, and because okay. I'd love to hear yeah. Rochelle's uh, perspective yeah, as, so, as a student as well. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing I would say is don't ever mention physiotherapy. Just don't. And then, you know, like you only can pay off physiotherapy if you say it yourself. But again, I think it comes back to the very, very beginning of the panel is is you've got to paint the picture to help people visualize what it is, you know, like what, what the everyday activities that are important to them, and then say that's what I work on with people. So I think it's the only the only way to do it. And um, if people still don't understand and they ask more questions, just use it to bring that richness across. But and, and, and that's not to be disrespectful because I actually, you know, I think we work really well alongside physiotherapists. It's really important, but I don't need to define myself in terms of physiotherapy. So hurrah. I <laughs> totally <laughs> Katrina. Rochelle, uh, you how how would you tackle it? I think I agree with Katrina, but I think also I think it is okay to say um, this is what the physio will do and this is what I will do because you might want to refer somebody to the physio or you might want to, they might already be working with them and the person kind of needs to know for their own goals what's what what the what are they getting? So I think it is okay to to say this is what uniquely what I do and that's what that is and that's the doctor and that's that and this is where it all fits together and this is what journey you're going to go on kind of I guess um and I think yeah but I don't think I think you should lead with like Katrina was saying you know lead with this is how I see us working together and the things that are important to you and how that's going to work but yeah also for the person to understand you know if they are receiving physio what that's going to look like for them as well if they're not really sure you know it might just be that you know the terminology sometimes can be a lot and there's a lot of people coming to see you and what is it you're actually going to get you know thank you Rochelle Okay, and um, just a final question. I think we've got just enough time for one person to, to have a stab at this. Do you think being dual trained, oh, my, it's jumped on my screen. Uh, do you think being dual trained, physical slash psychological, helps us to explain occupation, not just the what activity, but the why and the how? Who would like to come in on that? I'm happy to again, but I don't want to be to be always me talking. So, but yeah, I mean, it, that is actually one of our superpowers as well, isn't it? That we actually have that really broad based understanding. And again, to link back to the stuff that Jenny was saying in relation to criminogenic behaviours and how you're actually getting into some of these heads psychologically before you're working with them on anything to look at what the key to engaging them and what their motivation is. So, and, and, and all of that psychological understanding that we have really helps with that. So, um, so, yeah, so uh, but, yeah I, I think it's invaluable and I, don't, I think you only realise how important it is once you're out in the field and you're actually practising an occupational therapist. It's, it's not always completely clear when you're doing your training, I don't think, but I mean, I trained a long time ago, so it could be that, you know, people, it's much more obvious, but I think that subtlety is just fantastic that we have and it makes what we do really nuanced. And I think it's the nuance of what we do sometimes that means that people dismiss it as very simple. And don't actually understand the complexity of the reasoning and the different sources of evidence and information we put together to actually come up with the intervention plan that we did with the person. So, so much of what we do is co produced or co created with the people that we work with, you know. So. Sorry, I've just muted myself. Emma, we've got one minute. Do you want to yeah, just come in? I'll be very brief. I, I absolutely agree. I think that is absolutely or physical health, you know, based. We do not have separate needs and our occupations are not mental health or physical health. So that whole holistic view that we've got is unique. We have to own it and, and really embrace it. So yeah, thanks, Karen. 
Absolutely. And, and I would just like to, to, to follow on that, you know, at RCOT, when we're talking about occupational therapy, it's, it's the thing that makes us stand out from the other allied health professions that we are looking at. Psychological, the mental health, the mental health, the social care aspect and the, and the cognitive aspect. And the other AHPs really aren't in that space. So um, it, it really is for us um, a real strength. Uh, when we're having those wider discussions and, and thinking about the differences across uh, the AHP community. Um, thank you so much. Uh, panel and also just thank you to the level of engagement in the chat has been fantastic the number of questions has been really high and and really useful really good questions to be asking as well it's really struggling to choose which ones to to put to the panel it's been a fantastic evening and i hope it's been worth everybody's while and they have a fantastic occupational therapy week and remember we can change that uh, that perception and, and own occupation as our superpower as a profession. Thank you, everyone.